Hello, amateurs. Welcome back to another episode of the Amateur Rugby Podcast, here to help soothe your Sunday morning hangover with some wonderful rugby chat about the grassroots of the game. I'm your host, Tim, and I've got another amazing guest for you today. This person was born in the USA, but played blues rugby for Oxford University and went on to play for Wasps. She's now at the forefront of Sevens Rugby in the UK. Please welcome Elaine Gelman. Elaine, how are you? Hi, Tim. Thank you so much. Very good to be here. Thank you. Very welcome to the show. Now, let's kick this thing off. How did you get into rugby in the first place? What was your early, early steps? Yeah, sure. So um, so I was quite sporty as a kid, did did kind of everything, a bit of tennis, a bit of basketball, did some rhythmic gymnastics, things like that. Um, and when I got to university, I essentially very quickly noticed that there was no way I would be representing the my university in either basketball or tennis. Um, it was a division one sport for, for both of those. The players were about six foot one for both of those sports. Um, and I, I don't know why before I even got to university, I just thought, you know, I think I could be good at rugby. I want to give it a go. Um, I grew up with a brother, you know, so definitely and two cousins was used to, you know, rough housing and was always very sporty, like to run around. And yeah, that's how I got into it um, and just absolutely fell in love with the game. Amazing. So, I mean, back in sort of back then in the USA, rugby wasn't massive, was it? So how, how did it like come on your radar in, in that respect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny. I actually don't know because um, it wasn't something that was played in my high school. It was very unusual for women to play. The only thing I can remember, remember but I, I think I'd already gotten into rugby before this, was um, there was a Friends episode where Ross like decides to play rugby. And then when I look back on it now, I just find it so funny the way they portray it. I mean, it's just such a funny portrayal of, of the sport. But um, that's kind of the only thing I can ever remember seeing. But it, I don't think I ever saw that episode before I started university. So I must have just gotten some kind of marketing from from GW, which is where I went, that, that said, you know, here are all the list of different sports you can try. And I must have gotten into it that way because it, it definitely wasn't anything anyone in my family had ever done, none of my friends had ever played. Um, but it was at that time, especially women's rugby, was still quite popular at, at university. So a lot of people would would play. There were no official leagues even. You would just kind of play friendlies against other universities. But it was this kind of really wonderful, like almost like underground sport. And anyone that was involved, you felt like you were in this secret club, you know, like you would go to after parties at like essentially it was like frat houses, but they were rugby houses. And you just have these like kegs of beer and everybody would be singing rugby songs. And like, just like, it, it felt like a, like a special club. And I think to a certain extent in the US, if you play rugby, you still feel like that because it's not a mainstream sport, but those that are into it are just, just love it. And, and it's a completely a community game, um, or it was when I was there. I'm sure things have changed now, but um, yeah, it was just one wonderful sport to be involved with. Yeah, I love that. Um, and what I love most about it, and I think it's the same for a lot of people, the things you've sort of talk, talked about is the the off-field stuff, like the social things, all of that kind of stuff, which is so much a, a massive part of our sport. However, I want to know about the on-field stuff as well. What were your sort of early sessions like, you know, in terms of finding what position you're going to play, all that kind of stuff? I actually acutely remember getting onto the pitch and having no idea what was going on <laughs> and being amongst quite a few people. So we were just kind of tossed into it. And then I remember the seniors who it was their fourth year of being at university. They knew what was going on and they were sort of the starters. And then we kind of would, would just get chucked onto the pitch after a few training sessions and we'd just see how we go. Um, at the time, funny enough, like our coaches were actually like American football players, like they weren't rugby players. And then there was one guy who was a firefighter. He'd had a little bit of rugby experience, but I wouldn't say, you know, a lot. Um, and so it, it was just a, you know, figure it out as you go along. And, um, it, you know, I remember we used to play on these pitches that were just not fit for playing rugby. I mean, you'd, they'd be like glass and plastic and we'd have to like get off the um the, the underground or you know the the metro because I was in DC and we'd have to walk for like 30 minutes to get to these pitches we're like in the middle of nowhere that sort of started to change later on especially once you had un more like universities who would like give their pitches their main pitches to to the teams to use that's probably not the case anymore but I just remember but again it was just this like 
this cool thing that you would do with your mates and, and you'd get together on a, uh, I think for us, it was Saturday, uh, Saturday morning. And, you know, you'd bring breakfast and people would be eating on the way, walking over, you take the Metro down and then uh, nobody had cars cause it was Washington DC. Um, and yeah, after you'd like, like go to a party somewhere and it was just, yeah, really fun. And then you'd brag about how big your bruises were from these pitches that were really inappropriate for playing on. Again, I mean, it's just it's the kind of thing that bonds people together as well as in it. Those shared experiences of almost like hardships, like it. But it, you're yeah. talking about it so fondly. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, it, it it's actually interesting because as my career went on, um, and you know, so I ended up going to Oxford for a year as a, a year abroad, and then I went back to GW and then captained the team and kind of like shared my knowledge because we got really good training um, and really good coaching, really good facilities, you know, at Oxford, and then. Um, but what's interesting is as my career went on, actually that social part of it really decreased. I actually think I had a lot more fun off the pitch when we were playing in the US and had no idea what was going on than I did when I was, you know, at, at Wasps or, or you know, at, at um, Oxford. Of course, we had lots of fun and we had nights out, but it was more like planned. It was more um, serious. The rugby was more serious. And so, you know, after match, um, you know, festivities were also more serious because you'd be at a clubhouse, you'd be with the other team. Usually, you know, there would be some drinking, etc. you know, which isn't actually the bit that I liked. Um, it was more like the camaraderie and the fun of it. Um, but yeah, I actually found that that kind of time, I, I, I can remember it very fondly. Yeah. So tell me about how did the Oxford opportunity come around? Was that rugby based or was that study based and the, the rugby went along with it? Yeah, it was study based. So basically I was studying international affairs and political science at Washington um, at George Washington University. And the way the degree worked was in your third year, most people went abroad. And so I applied to um, a special program at that time at Oxford University and I was accepted. Um, and then when I, I did kind of, you know, I did well there and I played for the blues and all these things made good connections. And then when I was applying, applying for law schools in the US, I applied um, also to Oxford and um, and I got in and then there was a decision to be made, you know, am I going to go for another three years to Oxford or, you know, am I going to go to a US university? And I think the intention had always been, uh, uh, you know, I would if I went, I would always come back. Um, and that kind of hasn't happened. So I've been I've been in the UK now for 15 years. <laughs> Amazing. And like, what was, again, first experiences, first thoughts of your time going into that Oxford uni rugby setup? Was it, you know, was it miles different to what you'd experienced before? It was. Uh, I think, you know, Oxford rugby even back then was very serious. You know, the whole year, what you know, there was a very structured program. You know, you played at the time it was called uh I can't remember Bucks and now it's Busa or the other way around, you know. Um, so, you know, you played matches, you know, every Wednesday and then everything was basically geared up toward um, the varsity matches, which was a really, really big deal. And people, you know, there was a lot of competition. I remember when I was there that first year, uh, I think even that first year, there was so much competition that my jersey on the back of my varsity shirt, it was like the number wasn't confirmed until the very end. And in the end, I started but I think you can even see over like it was someone else's name and then they put my name over because all the decisions were, it was like all the way until the very end, there were quite a few people vying for every position. Um, so it, it was very serious with a very serious coach. Um, you know, we had to, oh, I just remember like every Tuesday we had fitness and um, I think we trained four or five days a week. And then we had fitness on a Tuesday at like 7 a.m. So you'd wake up in the winter cold in Oxford at like, you know, six in the morning or 6.15 in the morning. And it was freezing cold. There was still like snow on the ground. And you'd, I, and you'd cycle over to the university parks. And then he would make us do these like shuttles and he'd do it by like positions or where you had to catch someone or it was just awful. By the end, the girls were like throwing up on the side and then you had to do a whole defensive thing. And then you had to go, cycle to class um <laughs> but if you didn't go you wouldn't start the following day in the match so it was a no it was a, like a no questions asked you had to be there in order to gain your place um but you know it it, it kind of taught a lot of discipline um and i think also it weaned out those who didn't want it bad enough um <laughs> They would slowly, you know, uh, kind of drop off as the year went on. And then uh, obviously it made us a much better side, you know, it was taken very seriously, the rugby. Um, that's even more the case now because they play, they were playing at Twickenham a few years after I graduated and now they're at Stonex uh, where it was moved to this year. But, you know, it's, uh, you get some phenomenal athletes. We just had a, 
actually today, I think it was one of the girls in the Oxford size started for the England under 20s. So, you know, it's, um, you know, the, the standard was very high. Uh, the expectations were high, but, you know, I love that because I hadn't had that at, you know, at GW. So it was sort of the next step in, in, in my, in my rugby. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm just thinking of this on performance basis now. Is doing a massive fitness session the day before a game the best? I mean, probably people would think slightly differently now, I think. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, it was early in the morning, so there was plenty of time to recover. But um, but it was, you know, it was pretty fitness intensive because we had training on a Monday, then fitness on a Tuesday, then Wednesday we played, then Friday we had training, and then Sunday we had training, but on, on the pitches, which was more like a tackling sort of, um, that kind of session. So, there, and then on the days you weren't playing, you were expecting to be in the gym at least twice. So it was, um, you know, it, when I think back on it, like, yeah, that was a lot of sessions, but then, you know, we were students, so you could kind of go around your schedule and, and it gave you a focus and it was your friends you were going with anyway, and you wanted to be better. So it, it didn't seem like a lot at the time. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, now, most importantly, I mean, you've sort of talked about it already. It's so important to go and win that varsity game. So did you win? Uh, so I end up doing four varsity matches. Oh, wow. I started in all of them. So I won two and I lost two. So it was, uh, you know, I had both both experiences, you know, of high, high you know, uh, joy and, and jubilation and then just very low, you know, <laughs> and sad that, you know, your whole year, you know, culminated in the loss, but you know, that's, that's just sport for you. So I've got a 50% record. Yeah, that's not so bad. That's not so bad. Okay. And then, I mean, then another really famous rugby institution in, in Wasps, uh, what was the story in terms of how you got there? Yeah, sure. So when I graduated from Oxford, um, you know, obviously I moved to London. I started training at Clifford Chance, which as a lawyer. Um, and, you know, at that time, I obviously was like, I want to play the best possible rugby that I can. Um, and we actually knew a couple of girls that played for Wasps. So um, I started kind of commuting and going there and training twice a week. So I live in Canary Wharf and um, they train in East Acton. So quite quite a bit of a journey across um across London but uh you know it was um an incredible opportunity and you know at that time it was sort of right before the prem really properly started um but I got to play with some you know England players and and you know get that kind of training again also so competitive um so by the time I got there I'd kind of solidified as a scrum half um and when I was there I think there were seven scrum halves <laughs> so and a few were from abroad uh who you know um were kind of brought in and um, so that they can get game time, et cetera. And um, so it, it was also fiercely competitive, but the training was amazing. I mean, I, I always say the story, like I remember one of my first sessions I came down and you know what it's like as well. You come from university and you think you're kind of all that and you, you know, and I got down to the club and um, we just started playing some touch and I just, I just was like taken aback by the speed of the game and you'd be playing alongside like props and they were so fast and like the precision and the intensity of the tackle was just another level. Um, and that was a big, you know, that was a big surprise for me. Um, but uh, I guess it's like anything, it's like your career as well. You know, like you kind of, if you're starting here and you're the best at the club, in your club, then you go to somewhere else and you're the, you, you know, you're, you're no longer the best. You're just one of many good people. And then you go to a prone club and you're just one of, there's so many more people better than you. So um, yeah, it was a great experience. Uh, the only um, situation that ended up happening was obviously I was trying to um, qualify as a, as a lawyer and that commute with the expectation of the time commitment just became very difficult. So it took me like an hour and a half to get to training, an hour to have to get back and an hour and a half at training. So it was four and a half hours per day just to get to training and you had to go twice a week or you didn't start. Um, and even then you might not start, you know, it was just kind of a, that was just to, to get into consideration. So, uh, I, I did that for about a year, I think it was, and then it, it became very difficult. So I started playing for just local teams like, um, Millwall, which is right near me. And then Hammerhead, uh, Hammersmith, uh, and Fulham and, um, Hampstead. I did a stint at like each of those. And then, you know, when I was at Millwall, I remember I just, I wouldn't even train with them during the week. I would just play on the weekend. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, the standard was such that I could do that. Obviously, I couldn't do that at Wasp. So, um, yeah, it was a shame. I'd, I would have loved to stay there. It's still kind of my home club, um, you know, and, and really rooting for, for the 
you know, obviously for the club to get back in, um, in, in the position it was over, over the last years, which I think is in the process of happening. But um, yeah, it was just, it's one of the issues I think with, you know, trying to play 15s rugby, especially, you know, still for many women at the moment, and I'm sure for, for many men, but, you know, the, the professional, even if you are semi-professional, et cetera, you know, it's very hard unless you're really going to dedicate yourself to the sport. Um, but for me, sevens became the saving grace. And that's kind of how I got into sevens because you could just go and play in a tournament with your mates. You could just get a team together. You didn't have to train together um, and you could still play high level and you could travel the world, um, but you didn't have that same commitment on a weekly basis. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, well, you were still at was What I'm interested in, um, that first reaction of, oh my God, look at what's happening here. Everything's so fast. How did you react to that? Were, were you sort of taken aback or did you go, right, okay, I need to get in here and, and improve myself? Yeah, I mean, I think some of it was self-reflection, you know, because you come in and you think you're so good <laughs> and then you're like, wait a minute. Um, and I think also, you know, it's interesting because when you're watching things on television or you see, you watch matches, the professional matches, I don't think most people who haven't played at that level realize how fast it actually is and, and how demanding it really is, um, you know, and so for me, it, it was that realization, which obviously makes you question yourself as a player, because you're like, oh, well, I'm not really, you know, hot stuff like I thought I was. Um, and then it was just more like, let me learn from all of these people. Like, you know, when I was there, um, like Claire Purdy was there and she was super welcoming and nice. She was playing prop for England, you know, at that time. And there was a lot of other girls there who um, I think the number 10 had also previously been England captain. So, you know, whenever I got the chance to play with those girls, I just tried to keep up and tried to, you know, do my best um, and put on the best performance that I could. Um, you know, I, I, I have huge respect for, for people playing at that level because it, it is quite, it is very demanding. And I think now even more so than before, because it has become more professional and, you know, um, training on and off the pitch has become very important, but you're absolutely right. That mental side of it is very important because you've got to really like step up and match up. Otherwise you're going to get, you know, tackled into <laughs> into the back of the pitch if you don't. So, you know, it just kind of forces you into that. Yeah, chewed up and spat out the back of it. Um, now, what the next thing, so those sort of social teams that you went on to play for, um, I love that. I love the fact that you still stayed in the game and carried on playing. Talk to me about the girls. Were, were, they, were they like a different kind of animal compared to the, the girls of Wasps? How, how was it for you? Yeah, so um, so basically, when I finished uh, playing at um, at Wasps, I kind of moved to these local clubs, and then when I was at Millwall, I kind of saw that there wasn't really at that time, at least especially for teams that weren't in like a league. And for example, Millwall wasn't; the ladies were just trying to like get going. Um, there was no way to really tie them to other clubs, and that was something that I don't know. I'd never really thought about because Oxford was very well connected. Wasp was very well connected. So I started this company called Find Rugby Now. So you could literally go on, put your postcode in, find your local clubs, see if they're looking for friendlies, see you know if they need referees or if you can hire their pitches, whatever. And that's how FRN started. And then we started a men's team, a men's sevens team kind of that, that year. And then the following year, we started a women's team. And so I kind of started playing for the women's team um, and although over the years I've played for other teams as well, uh, but I found it quite fun to kind of put together FRN sevens teams and we go to Amsterdam, we go to Dubai, we go to lots of places and um, we would just put together kind of an invitational side and we try to get the best players that we could and depended on the tournament, you know, you might go and play beach rugby and it's a completely social tournament. And you just bring your mates or you would be going to Amsterdam seven and then you try to put together a really competitive side Um and what was very cool about Sevens was you would just meet people you would never, ever meet. So uh, one of the girls who actually still plays for the team, you know, she plays for Uganda. I met her for through another girl um, and she's played for our for our team for like eight years now, I think. Um, and yeah, so for example, we played together at Amsterdam and I met a bunch of Dutch girls and they all played for their university through, you know, I played in um, Tobago, seven, uh, I think it was called, yeah, Tobago Sevens with a team called Beavers from Canada and then met a bunch of Dutch girls through that. And then they ended up playing for us. So it was just a more, um, there's just the opportunity to really meet people outside of your circles. Um, I mean, they're all rugby players. So, you know, you've got that same fabric. Um, but I guess, you know, it, there's room to really kind of 
go beyond, um, you know, your everyday kind of circle and, and meet people from abroad, meet people who maybe don't, you know, don't, some of them don't play 15s. They just play sevens and just travel the world. But um, yeah, it's, it's just a really, really great community. Yeah. Okay. Before, we're going to talk loads more about the sevens, but before we do, I want to know more about Find Rugby Now. Like why, I, I mean, you said why, because it was clubs that were struggling to get connected, but not everybody sets up something like that. So what was it that made you really take action? Um, I just wanted to help, I guess. For me, it was just, you know, I could see that there was a need. This was before the RFU had a club portal. So now it does have a club portal. And annoyingly, they've called it Find Rugby. Um, but, uh, you know, the... So, and so the need isn't as much there now, but before, like you literally had to like Google to try to find women's teams in your area. Or for example, find rugby now, you can also find shops that sell kit or you can find pubs um, where you can watch, let's say women's rugby. So it's only really quite active to the London area. There was a, a plan to kind of expand and, and go all over the world. Um, but, you know, I think A, that need dim diminished a bit because you started getting the, you know, RFU and other um, similar bodies to actually create that kind of platform. But also Lit Sevens kind of took off. So that kind of became the priority in what we were doing. So um, FRN, we now use basically um, for, on the seven side, we, we, put out these teams and the goal is to help players who want to move to that next stage, play at a higher level, kind of experience that professionalism for the first time, get their foot in the door. And sometimes we, it means we lose those players, you know? So there's a great story I, I like to think about, which is, you know, one of the girls who plays for GB sevens now, um, she actually was spotted playing for us at our tournament by Saracens, got picked up and now plays GB7. So, you know, it, it's it's kind of an opportunity because I see myself in those players as well. You know, how do you get into sevens if your club side doesn't have a sevens team or if you have aspirations to play beyond just social sevens? How do you get into it? You can't just go play for Shogun or Hammerheads. Um, and so we'd like to kind of provide that opportunity for players to kind of step up and then, you know, have that experience of going abroad. Like we just came back from Hong Kong recently. Before that, we were in Grenada in the Caribbean um, and just giving players an opportunity to kind of meet, meet people from all around the world and um, also just just have fun uh, and meet, and compete at all these like really prestigious tournaments that normally are very hard to to play, you know, to play in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity. As a really heavy, heavy former prop forward, it wasn't really open to me. But um, what I want to know is, like, when you go away and go to these tournaments, how do you run it? Like, what's the sort of atmosphere uh, within your squad that you try and create? Yeah, so um, we have really great coaches. So Tamara Taylor, who's the former England Rugby World Cup winner and captain, she is our women's coach. Um, we've just had a change in men's coaches, but we have um, a fantastic a new coach uh, who's coming on board. So, I mean, we always talk about it and I always say, you know, regardless of performance, every player that walks away, want, I want them to have a good time. I don't want anyone to leave feeling I wasn't good enough. I didn't perform well enough. I didn't have a good time because ultimately it is a social sport. You know, the, you know, they're they they. They essentially, it is highly sponsored for our team, but they usually pay for their flights or they pay for something. So it's not completely free. So, you know, I always try to make sure everybody gets game time um, and everyone walks away feeling good about themselves. I think that's the number one thing, because I know I have played in teams before where that wasn't necessarily the case and winning was number one. And whilst we definitely want to win, I think there is a way that they're, you know, a good way to win. Um, and so I think I always, we always try to go for conscientious coaches that are empathetic and, you know, that player experience comes first, but I guess, um, we do like to bring a level of professionalism, you know, so we have really great managers. Um, we have all the equipment, you know, we've got the professional marquees, we've got walkie talkies, we've got, you know, things like that. Um, and I think over the years we've gotten better at seeing like, what do players need? How do you kind of, or how do you do a, a sevens tournament? Well, and I think the difference difficult part about a sevens tournament as opposed to like a match is it's all day. So you really have to control players, uh, water intake, their electrolyte intake rest. Um, and also they're like mental game because it's really kind of up and down. Cause you, you have this like match where, you know, you're going hundred miles an hour and then, you know, you stop and then you might have a two or three hour break. And then how do you get the players back up to that same level of energy? I think that's kind of the hardest thing about sevens. 
So, um, you know, we try to make sure that we have like a little hydration station. Um, we make sure the managers are always keeping the water going. We put electrolytes in the water. We remind the players to hydrate. We bring snacks, you know, to refill their energy levels and things like that. Um, we kind of, we have a board with all the timings to tell them when they need to come back. We try to keep, you know, the warm ups quite short and sharp before, you know, each of the matches so they don't overexert themselves. Um, and then obviously, depending on where you're playing, the heat is a big factor as well. So, you know, if you can get players out of the heat and or into ice baths and things like that. So we just try to do what we can, um, you know, to to get the best out of the players. Um, and uh, I think having been a player myself and the coaches having all played, that makes a big difference because, you know, we know what works and we know what, what players need. And sometimes that means completely changing the plan. So we might have a certain plan and then we look and we see, you know what, they're just too tired. We, we can't do that session right now or let's minim let's just do a 10 minute session because that's all they've gotten them. Then we do that. Um and uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, it's always trying to improve and, and, and get better at it. Yeah, well, that sounds thoroughly professional. Now, the other thing about sevens that I love is the kit. The stash in sevens tournaments is supreme, you know, yeah. sometimes maybe a little bit over the top for my taste. But tell me about your kit. What, what, what do you like to do with that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I knew you were going to ask me about this. I've prepared some <laughs> photos, actually. Um, so, I mean, yes, yeah, seven. So I think on the stash front, sevens is really fun because you're not as committed to certain patterns or colors like you are in 15s. You know, Harlequins are very, you have a very identifiable color. I think with rugby, you know, you're, you're free to move and do whatever you want. So what we tend to do is when we go to big international comps, we try to like incorporate special you know special things about that country or that competition so we just went to hong kong for example and we had um like the leaves from the you know from like that are really common in in hong kong there and then on our vests we had like um the the sort of the water with the buildings in the background which is like a landmark in hong kong um with the with the boat that you know you that the sort of identifiable so that was quite fun um our normal sevens kit is kind of green black and yeah, mostly green and black. And we, we, you know, we sort of vary it, but it's not too flashy, but it's flashy enough. Um, and then, you know, sometimes our vests and things are that are, 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 are quite bright, which is really fun. Yeah, nice. Okay. So we talked a lot about tournaments, especially overseas, but what's, what's the situation with sevens like in the UK at the moment? What's your thoughts there? Yeah, it's really interesting. So before COVID, um, there, the RFU had started something called the 24 seven series. Um, and actually one of our tournaments lit sevens was part of that series. We were going to be one of the landmark events and they had run the seven series for, I think two years and then COVID hit. Um, and it was a real shame because after that it never came back. Um, so, uh, you know, we have talked to the RFU, uh, in the past about it. Um, you know, it is, you know, part of the agenda of a wider, um, non 15s, you know, element of the game. So sevens is now sort of, I don't say lumped in, but, you know, lumped in with walking rugby and, you know, tag rugby and senior rugby, et cetera. So it's definitely not got the attention, I think, that it had before COVID. I think it was an upward trajectory before then, but unfortunately, because of budget cuts, it hasn't been. That being said, I will say, I think um, the future for sevens is bright because you do have kind of these series that are starting to pop up and give give a um, kind of a way for teams to progress. So the Super 7 series, which is for the elite teams that, you know, is run by Terry Sands, um, you know, I think has three legs this year. That is, you know, they call it super, uh, serious rugby. You know, that they, they bring a lot of teams from abroad, but that gives really good competition for the really high level teams here. And then without tooting our own horn, but Lit 7 series um, that, that, you know, we've really put in, in properly this year. We did a trial last year with five events. Um, we've seen over 100 teams sign up and it's just exploded phenomenally. And we're getting teams that have never played rugby before. And it's providing that continuity for them and also that ease of management. You register once, you're done for the whole summer. You know, it's kind of professionally run by us. They know who they're going to hear from. They know who to contact if they've got questions and then we take over on the playing side. So 
Um, you know, we, we run the fixtures and we run the referees. So we, you know, they'll be of a good standard and the fixtures are run well. And then they still get the flavor of going to other tournaments that are hosted by other clubs. So it's not the same experience every time, but it provides, I think, a level for progression. Um, and also, you know, at the end you get a big winner. And so, you know, it's, from a competitive perspective, it's fun because you see where you're going to be ranking in the table and then you want to play more because you want to beat the other teams and you want to win the big prize at the end. So, you know, I think that will provide um, hopefully a bit more stability for sevens in the UK. Uh, I think up until now, it's been difficult for amateur sides because, you know, you're playing Bournemouth one weekend, then you're playing in a beach rugby tournament, then you're playing in a local tournament, but there's no connection between any of them. They're very different teams. They're different rules. Um, you know, sometimes you can bring 15 players, sometimes you can bring 12, sometimes, you know, it's rolling subs, sometimes it's not. And that makes a really big difference. So what we are hoping to provide, and which I'm sure the Super 7 series provides, is that kind of ability for teams to, you know, grow as the summer goes on. And they can also still do other tournaments, of course. Um, but it, I think it will be an important way, especially for, uh, we have a few sides who have entered you know, every single tournament, um, it'll be really interesting to see how they progress and how they kind of can see their their progress as well, because they'll be pay- playing against most of the same teams every week. Um, so, yeah, I think I think sevens is on the up in the UK. But what I will say is obviously I'm coming from a very London centric perspective. I think in other parts of the UK, it's very hard to play sevens. I know we had last year a player who was actually the men's captain. He would fly in from Ireland for every tournament because there was no sevens in Ireland, in Ireland whatsoever. Um, and that's the same case in some places in Wales and, and, you know, even outside of London, you know, like there might be tournaments in England, but if you live four hours away, you know, coming to a tournament every time and spending money on hotels and things is quite difficult. So I do think, you know, that seven, there is a lot of sevens to play, but it depends where you live on how accessible it is or how much you're willing to travel. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, club and on one hand you see lots of tournaments you see them popping up all the time that that are run by um clubs but i would say a lot of those are very social one offs sometimes to just make money for the club which is absolutely fine and great um but i think you know we could use with having a bit more opportunity for people to play rugby where they can d- develop not just play kind of a one off you know um from a social perspective so yeah it's it's mixed i would say yeah, okay, cool. One of my core rugby memories, I would say, was I went to, I can't, you know what, I can't even remember what tournament it was, but it was at Twickenham. It was a long time ago. And my God, I had so much fun that day. It was just amazing. Like Lots of fancy dress, lots of partying going on. Is that the kind of thing you're trying to encourage at your tournaments as well? Or is it something slightly different? Yeah, so um, so we're actually running a tournament called Lit Sevens London Sevens on the 25th of May. That is more akin to that experience that you're talking about, that big Hong Kong Sevens, Dubai Sevens, you know, London Sevens experience. Unfortunately, this year, there is no Twickenham Sevens. So for the first time in decades, it's not happening. Um, and so we felt really, really um, strongly about not having a year where there wasn't that opportunity for people to go and have that experience. So, you know, fancy dress, watching really great rugby, having a couple of drinks or bringing your family down and, and just enjoying the day. Um, it's the only opportunity for most people to have that kind of um, experience with Rugby Sevens because it's not something that's on regularly. So that event on the 25th of May, which is at AFC Wimbledon, it will be exactly something like that that we're trying to go for. The uh, the Lit Seven series, I would say, is slightly different. It's more of like a community game. It's, it's obviously not in a stadium, and that makes a big difference. So um, the I think the, the, the rugby and the spectator quality is obviously that is always, you know, what we want to go for. And we encourage fancy dress and there's big DJ parties. Um, but, you know, it, it's slightly different when you're watching 12 elite, you know, international sides. We've got a side fly, flying in from the U.S., um, like a U.S. development side coming with with Mike Friday and his team. So, you know, that is obviously going to be a little bit different than if you're watching on the side of the pitch, you know, the you know, the men's social, uh, you know, from from some university. But I think what is great is, you know, there is both those both things are available. And I think, you know, 
all kinds of players can enjoy sevens. I know you mentioned like you were a prop and, um, you know, that opportunity wasn't afforded to you. But I think the key thing about rugby sevens is just the standard has to match up. So if you played in a team of all props against another team of all props, you would have the best time because you guys would just be able to play and it would be great. The issue you have with sevens is because there aren't enough sevens teams at the moment, you get a big disparity. And so, you know, if you do get an elite, you know, side playing a social side, that's when people don't enjoy it because obviously you're going to, you know, if you've got someone running in tries all the time and you don't have the players to just quite stop them, then that's not really fun for anybody. So that's also another reason why I think it'd be really great to get more and more players playing. And then you can just have players playing each other who are of the same level and then everybody can enjoy the game. Yeah, absolutely. You've just uh, made me remember something then. I did actually play sevens in a team full of props. At there the you go. Sevens. And somebody else you just mentioned there actually played for us. Mike Friday played with us. No way. With six props, yeah. That How was, was it? it? What was the result of the match? Uh, well, I don't think we did very well. I think we, we maybe scored one try throughout the entire tournament. I'm not sure. But there it was, you go. We did have fun there. It, well, that's the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So tell me about some more of the teams that you've got coming to uh, this big event at AFC Wimbledon. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's going to be really exciting. So we've got um, international teams like Jamaica, um, USA, and then you've got some elite sides like Shogun, Hammerheads, um, who, you know, obviously uh, play on the circuit. You've got the British Army. Um, you've got Fiji being represented by Rugby for Heroes, which is our official charity. You've got the Lions representing Africa and the Lionesses. Um, and then you've got our team, Find Rugby Now. The women's team is representing Netherlands, and we've also got the men's team coming down. So, yeah, it's going to be an exceptional standard of rugby, I hope. Um, you know, something for everybody. We've got the Jesters also coming from Ireland. They've got a bunch of Ireland development players. And what we've done is, as well is every team represents a country. So for those that don't really know the teams very well, you can just say, oh, I'm supporting Ireland or I'm supporting GB or I'm supporting UK, um, which is a little bit easier, you know. So, uh, yeah, it'll have that same feel of, of the previous kind of editions of London Sevens. That's a great idea, getting it sort of based around national teams. That's, um, yeah, good way of getting buy-in. Now then, uh, AFC Wimbledon. One, one of the things against Twickenham as a venue is it's not great in terms of travel. Wimbledon, what a great place for people to go uh, and enjoy. But tell me more about like, the stadium itself and the grounds. You know, what, what kind of size is it? I don't know too much about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually a brand new stadium. Like it was built four years ago. So it's actually fantastic for spectators because it's built in this like circular way and it's very smart. So you've got like bathrooms, then you've got like bars, then you've got the food and and you've got loads of loads of bars and um, loads of food vendor, um, then, yeah, vendors and, and different pop-ups. So you, you don't feel like you're ever waiting in a massive queue like you do sometimes at Twickenham. There's like five stations nearby, so really easy to get to. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just a really nice venue. I think I was there for a match that had about 7,500 people and you know, it really felt like you could just go up to the bar and grab a drink and you didn't have to wait in the queue at all. They also have like um, points where, you know, like these, uh, like the machines where you can go and get a drink as well. So if you don't want to go to to a counter. So yeah, re really nice venue. The London Broncos play there. So it is a rugby stadium as well. Um, and they have a beautiful pitch and you feel like you're really close to the players because you're, um, the, you know, the all the seating is just right on next to the pitches, which, it, you know, you don't quite get at Twickenham because it's so, so vast and so big. So slightly different experience. I think the maximum that it can accommodate is about 9000 people. So um, it's, you know, far smaller than Twickenham. But um, we hope that if we get a good amount of people, we can really have a good atmosphere there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, and what is your kind of hopes and dreams for this tournament? What are you sort of hoping to achieve? Yeah, I think, you know, it's year one. So we're very realistic about that. I think, you know, like I've been saying the whole time, the player experience for us is very important, making sure all the teams have a really, really good time. Um, you know, we've got things like ice baths for them and physio and nutrition products. And we're doing a reception for them the day before and just giving them a really unique experience. And then 
for the spectators, we've got, you know, a party stand and we've got a family area. We've got a fan zone with, you know, with stuff for kids there and um, some really delicious vendors. So um, just hoping that everyone has a great time. Uh, and then that will be a great starting point for next year. Uh, we'd like to get a few thousand people there, obviously, to, you know, fill the stadium. Um, but we'll see how it goes. You know, people are very last minute at buying tickets at the moment. So it's hard to gauge at the moment. So Definitely, everyone should buy their tickets right away on Ticketmaster. Um, and yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a fantastic time. Amazing. Okay, before we move on to the stash section of the show, is there, is there anything else you kind of want to say? Anything? Any sort of closing thoughts about that? Um, I would just say for anybody that has never played Rugby Sevens to give it a go. I think, um, you know, if you just go on Instagram and you Google, like you, not Google, <laughs> if you search for, for Rugby Sevens in your area or you search for certain teams, teams are always looking for players and there's a lot of social teams out there. If anyone has, you know, any questions or can't find a team, they can just message us at Lit Sevens. We will find you a team if our team is not right for you. So um, I would just say, just give it a go. Uh, you don't have to be a back uh, and it's a lot of fun, great way to stay fit and also just to up your skills in the summer because you can tell when players come back in September, you can see the ones that have been playing over the summer. So so just try it. Yeah, amazing. What a great message. Okay, brilliant. Uh, let's move on to the stash section. Elaine, what is, what is your favorite bit of stash that you've ever received? That Oh, that I've ever received. So yeah. I think probably my favorite piece of stash it's probably my first blues blues jersey. Uh, I think that was pretty special. I think it was it was very competitive, and and I was going against girls who had been playing rugby for much longer than I had. Um, so that was pretty special. But equally, when I graduated, um, I was asked to put together and still do actually on a yearly basis the team. Um, called the major stanleys at oxford so up until a few years ago there was a men's match called the major stanleys match where the blues side would play basically an all-stars team um that you know that included some alumni and then some you know re recruits and it would happen every year and it was in honor of of major stanley and um it there was never a women's side and then a few years ago the club decided we're going to put a women's side together and i was a part of that side and i got that together and i manage it and i've been doing that for the last I think three or four years. Um, so, and the, that kit is all white. So you you have like the, the the blues who are in dark blue and they're all wearing blue. And then you've got the um, alumni who are wearing all white. And then you take a photo together and it's it's pretty special. So that one that one was also quite memorable because it was quite historic because it, we, we hadn't had that until then. Amazing. Well done for getting involved in that again as well. Just creating things all over the place for rugby. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> Um, now, what is your favorite kit of all time? So this can be any team from any era. So I knew you would ask me this. So I brought some photos. Uh -huh. um, so I think as we're talking about rugby sevens, I thought it would be apt to go for some rugby sevens kit. So I think my favorite fo my favorite kit thus far has been the 2016 GB sevens kit. Oh, I yeah. thought it was really nice. Uh, just like very classic. You had like, beautiful coloring it fit really well um and was yeah it, it was really nice contrary to that i know your next question will be what was your least favorite kit um also uh well this wasn't gb sevens this was england sevens there was a period of time in like 2013 2014 that england sevens became very obsessed with triangles now i don't know why i don't know where the triangles came from but they started producing kit like this Oh my God. And like this, <laughs> and that wasn't a vibe. So that, you know, I think whilst we're, they've had a, some very, very nice kit over time, I think the triangle kit was my least favorite. Why the triangles? I mean, I just know. must be a design trend or something that they hooked into. I don't know. It was, yeah, it was bizarre. It was a period and there was, yeah, there was different variations of it, but, but yeah, I prefer the more classic look, which was a few years later. Yeah, for sure. And those people listening on the podcast, you're going to have to go and subscribe to the YouTube channel to make sure that you can go and see those kits on the video. Um, okay, that's brilliant, Elaine. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, again, shout it out. T tell me about the Lit 7s. When is it? How do people get tickets? All that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we hope to see everybody on the 25th of May at AFC Wimbledon. Tickets are just £27 for adults, £15 for kids. You can get them on Ticketmaster or you can go to lit7s.com and see all the teams that are participating. We're going to have James Haskell doing the after party, which is going to be awesome. And then IMD Legion, which was um, a dance group from Britain's Got Talent that will be doing a couple of performances on the day. So it's perfect for kids. And then we've got a, a party stand for all those that want to get boozy and have a good time. So something for everyone. Okay, absolutely amazing. People listening at home, I'm going to link all of that in the show notes below and also at amateurrugbypodcast.com. So it just leaves me to say thank you, Elaine, for your time today and all the amazing work you're doing for rugby. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, Elaine. Bye-bye. Okay, there she goes. What a great chat that was. Just involved in so much in rugby. I love people who just get out there and get stuff done. It's just really inspirational. So thank you for all you're doing. Now, during the great rugby run over the last three years, I've visited literally hundreds of rugby clubs and lots of them struggle a little bit with their social media. They're not getting enough sort of bang for the buck, the amount of effort they're putting in, or they're not quite sure what they're doing. It's a bit loose in certain areas. I'm looking to hopefully put something together to help clubs out. So if that's you, go to amateur rugby podcast.com forward slash social stick in your details there tell me what issues you're having and then hopefully we'll get something put together now if you've enjoyed this podcast you can do all the usual social media stuff write reviews comments likes shares all that jazz but what i'd really like is if you mention it to someone in person the next time you're down your local rugby club so until then get out and play